Welcome to Edgewood, Alaska. <laughs> yes. I posted a thing on Facebook the other day and it said, they said, go start a cowboy church in Edgewood. It'll be fun. Nobody told me about the 12 foot of snow that would come with it. So anyway, hope you all had a great Thanksgiving. If you're visiting with us, uh, you're out of town. Thank you for being here. We uh, know it was, you had a good time visiting with family. If you live in the area and this is your first time, thanks for being here and checking us out. And uh, a lot of folks are on the road and, and traveling. And uh, Robbie is, is Suzanne here. She, she stayed home. Yeah, they drove all night. What time did you all get in? Oh, you got in at 10.30? Ah, I didn't forget you. You're a bad example. Uh, I was going to say they got in at 3 o'clock, and here he is this morning, but he had plenty of sleep. Uh, but uh, they went to Louisiana and came back, so we've got people all over the place. So excited to see you here this morning. So if you would, stand, and we got Christmas music. Turn somebody and go, pre-Merry Christmas. And uh, welcome somebody and give them a great... Shake their hands. <laughs> Hey brother, how are you? Hey, you gonna make it? Uh, oh, poor. I'm a little guy. <laughs> Hi, baby girl. How are you? You're gonna make it? <laughs> Not now. All right, thank you very much. And grab a seat there. Well, last Sunday, after church, we had a bake sale. And uh, I mean, we had more fun. Those of you that are at the bake sale, uh, and I got to what? Oh, 33, shut up. Uh, you know, uh, so anyway, uh, I got to be the auctioneer and uh, I mean, we, we uh, auctioned off 110 pieces of baked goods. And I mean, we started at two and I think we got done about 4.30. And uh, I had more fun running people's bids up. Uh, <laughs> but of course, I did it all in the name of Jesus, so it was okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, I did my job right. That's right. But are you ready? Huh? How? I didn't need none. I didn't buy. I was given one. You know, I was a test, I was a test dummy. Uh, I was given one, but it was great. I, it was great. Okay. But hang on a little bit, you know, cool your jets there, Turbo. Uh, and uh, so we had a, a great time. But you ready for this? You ready for this? When it's all said and done, we raised $2,505. Isn't that awesome? And uh, so that's going to go toward our chuck wagon. And uh, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna be a chuck wagon on the outside, but it's gonna be built like a Tesla on the inside, okay? <laughs> and uh, I mean, we're gonna have all kind of stuff on the inside, and uh, that's that's a pretty exciting deal. So, uh, uh, thank you for being a part of that. It was crazy, uh, you know. Uh, some of the guys, the husbands, I don't know if their wives bribed them, but I went back and looked at who bought stuff, and I mean, some of the husbands bought all their wives stuff back so I don't know if they they 
I don't know if they got bribed or what, but we had we had some cakes and cookies that were like works of art. I mean, it was ridiculous. I mean, you didn't even want to eat them. It was crazy, crazy stuff. So anyway, we got a young lady here today. I'm glad you walked in here, miss. So uh, Sarah Jo, come on up here. And uh, this is Sarah Jo Sams, and she's the daughter of Tom and Lisa and the granddaughter of Dell and Nina. And she's the one that, if you remember, I'd mentioned a few times talking about a, a wayward child uh, that had moved to Detroit. Um, <laughs> she's the wayward child. That moved from Peralta, New Mexico, to Detroit. Okay, personally, I think the armpit of America. Uh, and technically, she's in the mission field. And uh, she's a missionary. Uh, no, she's not. Uh, but she, she went out there because she had a dream. She works for a big company that promotes major concerts all over the country. And so she works for them. And then she, she has another little side job. But she got involved in a ministry. And uh, it's called Skin Deep. Beneath and, the skin. Huh? Beneath the skin. Beneath the skin? Skin deep, same thing. Uh, okay, and uh, beneath in Greek means skin deep. Uh, and so beneath the skin, excuse me. And uh, remember from last week when we were, I was doing the message on mental illness, I talked about the millennials and how because of they'd lost so many social skills and their social skills are here now that there's a high level of depression and that's what this ministry is about. And I'm big personally and uh, it is a ministry, it's solidly biblically based, and I'm, I believe as a church ought to be a mission supporting sending church. You know, I mean, I'll talk about a little bit of that today, but in Matthew 28, Jesus said, you know, go into all the nations, baptizing, and he's, you know, he started with Jerusalem and Samaria. Well, this is our Jerusalem, but then we go outside and then we go to the world, and I believe in supporting missions. So we do support some ministries, uh, but this is one that she called and shared some information about. And if you have a millennial child or grandchild uh, or know people that do, uh, you understand, you know, what they're going through. So she's going to share a little bit about this ministry for us. Uh, and uh, then we'll talk a little bit after that. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so Beneath the Skin, I started an internship. It was based by Brittany Mullins, or created by Brittany Mullins in 2015. I started in about September, and I'm a match manager with them. And what Beneath the Skin is, is it's a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring group, completely Christian-based. Um, we offer, we match a hand-picked mentor and mentee based on location, age, interests, different things we've been through. Like we get to read people's testimonies when they submit their applications and we get to see what they've been through. And it's really amazing to see all these different people wanting to help. We have mentors, mentees from all over the 50 states. Um, and we handpick one mentor, one mentee, and we match them for a year. And what you do is you offer, as a mentor, you offer unconditional love and support to this mentee because our entire fight is against the stigma of loneliness because sti Cigna did a study. And uh, millennials and Generation Z are the loneliest generations. And so we're combating against that and trying to defeat loneliness, depression, anxiety, just pro by providing unconditional love like Jesus gives us. Um, it's an amazing company, and we're completely nonprofit, so we depend solely on our donors, investors, people like that, because we don't get any kind of funding that we don't charge. It's completely free for anyone who signs up. Um, I mean, I have had a heart for this company. We just launched a mail pilot. We are in dire need of male uh, mentors and mentees, and we seriously need female mentors. All you have to do to be a mentor is to be a believer between the ages of 18 and 35 and live in the U.S. So it's very, and you just have to have a heart to help. We have people, we're asking people to sign up as Beneath the Skin family members because we have one-time donors and we truly appreciate the heart that people have to give, but we're asking for family members and what that means is you sign up as a monthly donor. We have things as little as 15 bucks a month and it because we don't get any kind of other funding and you get like birthday benefits you get a free t-shirt you get a bunch of different benefits it says on our website exactly what you get so you're, we're not just asking you to blindly invest you get updates on the matches that you're sponsoring and all the different updates throughout the company it's 
truly amazing, and I really have, I really hope it does take off because Brittany Mullins has a serious heart for helping people, and this woman is the most selfless human I've ever met. She just got back from Peru feeding the hungry with her husband. Like, it's an amazing company. So if you guys feel led, or if you have any questions about either being a family member or a mentor, a mentee, feel free to talk to me after church. I'll answer any questions you have. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you. You know, and even though she lives in Detroit, this is her church, and she calls this church home. And uh, so she's one of ours, and you know we don't get to see her that much. She wasn't supposed to be here. She surprised her mom and dad. She called her mom from the airport and said, "Hey, come pick me up at the airport." And her mom said, "No, you're not." <laughs> and she said, "I'm I'm here." And and so the mom took the phone and go, "Well, no, you're not. Well, y y well, if you are, tell your dad. Tell your dad. Tell, like dad was supposed to go. Mm, she's here." Uh, and so anyway, but uh, she surprised them, and uh, so we got to spend the holidays with them. But anyways, talk to her about it because, folks, let me tell you, it is the highest, it's the fastest growing age group of mental illness mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in our country. And it's because of the, huh? Oh, I'm talking to them. Okay. Well, I don't know why I was doing that. Uh, because it's, uh, it's uh, because of the loneliness and the depression. Uh, a lack of purpose. Uh, many of them haven't gone to college. They can't get jobs. Uh, and you know they go to college and they get jobs that are business degrees those types of things and they can't go do their jobs so they're getting hourly jobs um, and so we just need to support her as a church we're going to invest and support it uh, so just check with uh, check with her afterwards and we're always going to be praying for her as well the other thing I want to share with you real quick and uh, we'll turn it back over to the band is we're going to start today, and I shared with you last week, uh, basically uh, building our new church. And we're going to start today. So uh, we're all going to get in the buses and go over there and start digging trenches. Uh, <laughs> what we want to do is we already have a building on it. We, uh, if you drive by, you'll see a 12 by 32 uh, building, a real nice uh, like cabin that was given to us. And so we're going to use it for, you know, kind of construction offices as we get going and kind of a meeting place, you know, for that. And then eventually our idea is that we're going to lift it up in the air and use it for our announcer's box for our arena. And saying the arena, uh, we're going to start uh, raising the funds to get our arena built. So here's how we're going to do it. Uh, we're going to we're going to uh, ask people to consider buying pipe. It's $25 for one stick of pipe, and we need a hundred pieces of pipe to build the arena, and then uh, another 154 pieces of pipe to fence in 10 acres initially. So if you'd like to be a part of that. Uh, we'll go pick the pipe up once you know we reach our first goal uh, you can buy you know one piece of pipe uh, you know and if you'd like you can buy it all we don't care we won't hold you back from that <laughs> Ralph buy it all uh, and uh, so but or any donation and we've had people come up today that they've shared that with people that don't even go to the church and uh, you know one of our men was handed a hundred dollar bill you know from somebody that didn't go to our church and go said go buy four sticks of pipe uh, that want to be a part of that so like I said it's $25 a, a stick uh, we've seen this work in another church and raised you know got all the pipe we need and if you want to you can come out and even put your name on a piece of pipe uh, and so when it goes in the ground and we have the arena you can go I bought that pipe I made I built that piece right there uh, instead of bricks you know some churches they buy a brick you know and you put no we're gonna have pipe uh, but if you choose to do that and like I said you know we, you know this is how we're gonna help cut our cost uh, and we're just going to pay for it as we go so we don't have any indebtedness. Uh, so if you'd like to do that and make that gift, uh, then just on the offering envelopes back there, just put on the front pipes and uh, your name and it'll just you know once again it's recorded just like your regular giving is and uh, we'd love to be able to go get this pipe and be able to start you know once you know we're no longer in Alaska uh, and the ground's not frozen we'd like to get started moving this pipe pretty quick and getting it in and, and getting going and so and you, if you don't that's okay you can come help us you know build the thing if you can weld or you can use a post hole digger uh, you know we'll do that as well so it's it's going to be pretty exciting to see that go up. Uh, people are talking about it. You know what's so amazing is that people can't understand 
in this community, how a seven month old, eight month old church was able to go buy 62 acres of land. You know, and they say, how do you do that? And it's, it's just real one thing, it's just one phrase, but God, you know, it's just a God thing. And uh, God's blessed us and uh, there's a reason why he's blessed us. And so uh, just wanted to share that opportunity with you. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, at this time, we believe in prayer, and we always encourage you that if you know there's something we can pray with you about, to let us know. Uh, and so, let's pray today for uh, for Sarah, and uh, also pray for Joanne. Uh, Joanne's had a pretty w rough week on her chemo, and we want to lift her up as well. Well, Father God, thank you for the season of Thanksgiving. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to visit with family and friends during this. And Father, we live in such a commercialized world that seems like the focus is more on Black Friday than it is on Thanksgiving for the freedom that we have and for the blessings that we've received. And so Father, we want to just pause for a few minutes today and say thank you, God, for how you've blessed us. And we want to thank you for the tough times that we go through because, Father, it's in tough seasons that we either de de decide to either trust and put faith in you or get angry and push back and it's in the tough seasons that we have the opportunity to grow and so father as we come down to the end of this year 2019 father i pray that we just slow down as individuals and as a church and take our focus off the things around us and put our focus on who you are that we don't forget father that it's as we come to Christmas, it's not about the tree or the holiday, but it's about what it represents. And so, Father, we thank you for that. Father, we thank you for Sarah. We thank you for her passion that we saw in this ministry. And Father, I pray that as a church that we will come along this ministry beneath the skin and support them, but also that we, we pray for Sarah, that is, she's mentoring another young lady, that God, you'd give her wisdom. And that, Father, you'd give her the words to speak, to encourage, to lift up. Father, we just live in a society that, for so many people, it's just very depressing. And they don't know how to deal or cope with life. And, Father, what a great opportunity that she has to be able to take what you've taken her through in her life and, and, uh, and to help another person grow. And so, Father, we lift her up. We lift up the ministry and the leadership of the ministry. Father, we pray for Joanne today. And, God, we thank you for her attitude, for her heart. She walks through this cancer. And God, we pray right now that you just reach down and touch her and, and give her peace and give her strength as she goes through this. And, Father, thank you for this church. Father, thank you for everyone that's here today. Father, thank you for our visitors, our guests. And Father, we, we pray for everybody here today. And, and Father, that we would all learn to trust you more. That we, Father, we would never forget that you love us unconditionally. And that, Father, whatever the needs, issues, or challenges that we have, that, God, that uh, we'd walk away today knowing that you love us, that you promise that you'll never leave us or forsake us, that you promise that in this turbulent world that you give us peace and so father i pray for that in our lives right now god give us wisdom as we move forward on this building father help us keep it about ministry and all about ministry give us wisdom to be good stewards father as as we all invest in some level of time talent treasure father it's not equal gifts it's equal sacrifice and so father help us to be wise as we move forward uh, to be good stewards of the resources that you give us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
time we're going to go ahead and dismiss the kids so y'all can head on back with your teachers and we're going to continue to worship thank you many times burdens drive me to my knees and I wonder what the reason could be or the things that bring me pain or the day filled with rain and my tears like the river start flowing again many times I cry Jesus hear my plea precious Savior have mercy faith grows stronger and I understand that nothing can touch me that doesn't pass through his hand nothing can touch me though life's pillows may roll nothing can touch me for he's still in control Nothing can touch me unless he says it can. For nothing can touch me that doesn't pass through his Jesus, hear my plea, precious Savior, have mercy on me, then my faith grows stronger, and I understand.
understand that nothing can touch me that doesn't pass through his hand. Nothing can touch me, though life's pillows may roll. Nothing can touch me, for he's still in control. Nothing. Unless he says it can For nothing can touch me That doesn't pass through his do a song that has um, has a very deep personal meaning to me. Um, it was 20 years ago, about a week and a half ago, 
that my mom went home to be with the Lord. My dad had passed away three years prior to that. And um, I didn't come across the song until years later after she had gone. And when I, when I read the words and when I went through the song, I just went, oh my gosh, this is what my mom was telling us growing up. You know, I, I became a Christian when I was just shy of being nine years old. My mom would always tell us, you know, in our time, you know, we have to make the decision um, to accept Christ. But she would always say, y'all need to come to Jesus. Some, sometime in your life, y'all need to come to Jesus. And I have three brothers. And I would hear her say that, you know, from time to time. She wouldn't push it, you know, she'd just say, because it's that important to her that we came to Jesus. And this song is called Untitled Hymn, but it's basically Come to Jesus. Thank you so much, Diana. That's what it's all about, folks. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. That's why we're here. If you have your Bibles, uh, go with me to Matthew 18. Uh, we're going to spend the next literally five weeks uh, as we get through the holidays 
in Matthew 18. I've been sharing with you that we're going to get into that. And uh, we're starting a new series, and it's called, How Then Shall We Live? Uh, and uh, Matthew 18 is a, a very, very, very strong uh, chapter in all of the Gospels. And we're going to jump into it a little in just a little bit. A little girl named Crystal was sitting around one night and hanging out with mom and dad. And, and uh, she was, you know, a little preschool, kindergarten age. And she said, uh, Daddy, you're, you're, you're the boss of the house, aren't you? <laughs> And very proudly he said, well, yes, baby, I, I am the boss of the house. And she said, well, she decided she'd bust his bubble. And she said, and, and Daddy, you're, you're the boss of the house because Mama told you to be, huh? And uh, so uh, well, many of us men, we can recognize that to, to be true. I came across a story this week as I was preparing, and I, I thought, well, this, this fits right in, and I'd like to just read it to you. It says, several years ago, a preacher from out of state accepted a call to a church in Houston, Texas. True story. Some weeks after he arrived, he had the occasion to ride the bus from his home to downtown area, the downtown area. When, when he sat down on the bus, he discovered that the driver had accidentally given him a quarter too much in change. As he considered what to do, he thought to himself, you'd better give the quarter back. It'd be wrong to keep it. Then he thought, yeah, forget it. It's only a quarter and who'd worry about such a small amount? And then he thought to himself, you know, they charge way too much for the fare. They'll never miss it. I'll just accept it as a gift from God <laughs> and keep my mouth shut. When his stop came, uh, well, well, when his stop came, he paused as he went to the door for a minute, and, and then he reached in his pocket and pulled out the quarter, and he handed it to the driver, and he said, here, you, you gave me too much change. And the driver, with a smile, replied, aren't you the new preacher in town? <laughs> yes, he replied. Well, I've been thinking a lot about going somewhere to worship, and I just wanted to see what you would do if I gave you too much change. I'll see you at church on Sunday. <laughs> when the preacher stepped off the bus, he literally grabbed the nearest light pole and held on and said, God, I almost sold your son for a quarter. And then he wrote this, watch your thoughts, they become words. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits, they become character. And watch, your, and watch your character, it defines your destiny. And as we jump into this new series on how then shall we live, and we, we get into this passage of scripture in Matthew 18. I'm going to give you a little bit of backstory on, on Matthew 18 and the Gospels. You know, when the early church fathers put the Gospels, the Bible together, they agreed 100% that Matthew was the first Gospel written. And, and over time, as other scholars began to study and, and look at the Gospels and, and try to put some timelines on it, uh, became a big debate that Matthew was not the first gospel written that many think it was Mark and there, there's reasons they think it was Mark because of some of the discourse and the dialogue and and some of the things that Mark included that Matthew didn't include and and then it, it, it goes on uh, to talk about well it may even be Luke that was the first one and so there's been a lot of debate but the, the, the key thing is is that at the end of the day the conclusion is is that all of the gospels are inspired by God and, and that, that the events that are in the Gospels have been either supported because they were spoken of in the Old Testament and they became uh, reality. And we have seen that. So prophets talked about it in the Old Testament and, and then we see it fulfilled in the New Testament. And so you know, when you look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament is kind of a picture of the foretelling of the New Testament. And the New Testament supports the reality and the factual of the Old Testament because there's over 900 prophetic statements in the Old Testament that were fulfilled, that have been fulfilled in the New Testament. 
and so uh, there's a lot of debate because of that. But the main issue is that that it's found to be true. I was watching a, a, a very liberal station this week and, and they, they do a lot of stuff on science and I was flipping through the channels and I just happened to hear the word Goliath. So I stopped and, and, and they were doing a, a archaeological dig trying to disprove stories in the Bible. And on this particular dig, they were trying to disprove what they called the myth of David and Goliath that there was no such thing as Goliaths. There were no such things as, as you know, Philistines or any, any type of inhabitants of any land that were large described in the, in the Bible. And so as they found the city where the Philistines actually lived, they, they had a quandary. And the quandary is, is that they, they began to find houses and, and, and types of homes that normal sized people of that day lived in. But then as they continued to, to do more archaeological digs, they began to come across these weird structures that were much bigger. And they, they couldn't understand. They kind of looked like a carport, you know, made out of rocks. And they, they couldn't figure out that it was like this whole neighborhood of these things. And so they thought, well, maybe it's something for livestock. And, and, and they couldn't find anything. And so they began to dig. And as they dig, they began to find pottery and pieces of pottery and they were larger pieces of pottery and they came up on this one big bowl that was completely intact and on it was inscribed the word Goliath. <laughs> and as they dug deeper and deeper they began to find clothes, vests that did not, would not fit. I mean, it would just engulf a normal sized man and, and swords that were huge in length, seven, eight feet long and, and helmets and sandals. And so to their surprise, when they went to try to disprove that there were ever, you know, giants of the land, they once again proved that the Bible's true, that these big kind of carport looking deals, those were the homes in the neighborhood basically that the giants lived in. And that there was more than just one of those. And you, you can go through the scripture and, and if, you, if you take the time, you, you find out that the scripture supports itself. The, the scripture validates itself. And so when we get into this whole thing about, you know, uh, where, when a, a book was written or when it wasn't written, the truth is at the end of the day, it's the inspired word of God. And, and, and the reason I mention Mark and Matthew is because in Matthew 18, the same story is told in Mark, but Mark gives a little bit more detail to it. But one of the things that I find interesting when you go through Matthew, it's, it's the first gospel that we read. Uh, and so there is dispute about it being chronological. But Matthew 18 is probably, as many people think, one of the most unused, uh, misinterpreted, passages or chapters in the Bible. Uh, there, are, there are several things we're going to get into. Uh, one that we're going to talk about today, it just talks about when the disciples got into an argument about who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. Uh, next is Jesus talks to them about temptation and we'll get into that and then looking down on others and then uh, how to treat believers who sin and then how to deal with unforgiveness. But before you get to Matthew 18, you find Jesus, he's doing some incredible teaching. And there's a pattern to his teaching. Because all of this, Matthew 18 is not written to the unbeliever. And in those days, the unbeliever would be the Gentile. It was, it was written to the believers. Okay? And, and, and so Matthew 18 is written to the church. Now, Matthew 16 is the first time that the word church is ever used in all of Scripture. Matthew 18 is the second time that it's used, and it was used by Jesus. Jesus introduced the concept of the church the very first time, and it, it's ekklesia is the Greek word, and it means a group that's called out. Oh, and that's, that's the technical term, but it's also meant, you know, that, that it's the body of Jesus Christ. Now, you got to paint this picture, okay? Now, you have to understand how this thing lays out. Jesus comes on the scene 
And, and through all the Old Testament, the Jewish people, because of their disobedience, they are constantly being disciplined by God. They're constantly in captivity. They're constantly in trouble. And the number one reason they're in trouble is because God's got a plan and they said, we're going to do our own thing. All right. We're, we're going to take God's idea, but we're going to put our twist to it. Therefore, you know, you have the captivity that they were in captivity to Egypt. And as you go through it, you know, in the New Testament, they were still under, you know, basically being slaves and captive to, to the Romans. And so all of this history of the Jewish people, they, they are in a basically a physical struggle. It's a military struggle. And, and they win when they obey and they they lose when they disobey. In fact, if you, you go to the story of uh, Jericho and God said to Joshua, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to get your, your, your people together and for seven days I just want you to walk around this city with these tall thick walls that were probably anywhere from 12 to 14 feet wide, you know, thick, made out of solid stone. And I want you to walk around and, you know, I want you to, you know, make all this noise. And then on the seventh day, I want you to do it. And then, you know, you scream and yell and the walls will come down. And he said, here's one condition. There's one condition. Jericho was far greater in numbers of, of, of men that could fight this crowd, the Jewish people. All right? And so they know that. And, and God says, don't take swords, don't take spears, just take instruments. Okay. Now, can you, can you imagine that? Yeah, right, God. Yeah, right. Uh-huh. Joshua, what, what, what have you been drinking? You know, we're going to go with pans and bang and scream and shout and these thick walls are going to come down and we're going to defeat this, this city. And here's what God says. He says, when you take it, Take the people, but don't take any of the goods. In fact, then, in, and in fact, the word is bounty. Don't take anything. I mean, don't take a thing. Don't take money. Don't take clothes. Don't take a cup. Don't take a member. Don't take. You, this is not about memorabilia. So you can say, look, look, we were at Jericho. I got it right here. Don't take anything. Take the victory. Wipe out the people and go on. So they go in and do it. Walls come down. They get the victory. They go to the next battle because God says, if you do what I say, I will bless you and you will have victory. So they're pretty confident. Hey, you know, that banging, you know, making all that noise and screaming and shouting kind of works. We saw it. Boy, their faith goes up, you know. Their morale goes up. God's got us. So they go to the next battle feeling pretty good. And if we could take them, we can take anybody with our numbers. And they go to the next battle and they get their clocks cleaned. And they're like, whoa, whoa, God, Joshua says, God, you said that if we did this in Jericho, that we wouldn't be defeated. We would have victory. And God said, I said that, but I also said what? Don't take anything. Except there's one guy. And he decides on the way out of town. He reached down. He picks up a goblet, a cup, slides it in his jacket. And one person who disobeyed caused the defeat for the entire nation. And that's kind of the history of Israel. When they listened, they were victorious. And they would even, they would even win with, with hundreds or, or less than hundreds and go up against thousands and they would win. But when they disobeyed, and so Israel even to this day... Those that are not Messianic Jews, that don't believe in Jesus as the Savior, they're still waiting for a Messiah. But it's not a spiritual Messiah. They're waiting for a warrior. They're waiting for a military commander to come to lead them into victory against all of the nations around them. And so if you go and you listen to their politics and if you, you listen now that, that the president made Jerusalem now the head, okay, and he took it all back to the city of Jerusalem, you know, there's all kind of stuff going on that I'll just tell you this right now, when they announce that they start to rebuild the temple, Solomon's temple in Jerusalem, when that's announced, just get ready. Because it's not going to be too long after that that the trumpet hollers and we're out of here.
That's going to be one of the final signs. So I was reading this week. I was going through some stuff, looking at Israel, and they had Netanyahu, and he was up there when they, you know, when he had Trump's son and son-in-law and daughter, and they, that's the celebration that they had when they, they moved the capital back to Jerusalem, you know, and Jerusalem's a city, and underneath it, it said, you know, said, Netanyahu says the next step is to begin to rebuild the temple. Now that's prophetic, folks. Now, we don't know when it's going to happen, but the leader, prime minister, says that's our next step. All right? So, here's the scenario. Jesus comes along the scene. The Jews in that time, that's what they think. You know, we've been beat up. We, we want all the way back to Jesus' time. We're looking for a military guy to come along and give us victory. And this guy, Jesus, shows up and starts getting all kind of... A buzz about because he's doing the miracles. He, you know, John the Baptist, you know, goes before him and Jesus says, baptize me. And, and, and they're going, who is this guy? And then he goes to the wedding and he performs his first miracle. And, and that's chapter about two. And then chapters three and four and up to five, Jesus is doing miracles and he's raising all this buzz. And people are going, who is this guy? And then it comes to chapter six. And he starts teaching the Beatitudes. But in, before that, he's going around and he's finding guys like Matthew, Mark, Luke. And says, come on, follow me. And they're going, who are you? Well, I'm, I'm the Messiah. So in their mind, they start following this guy. They, 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 don't, they, they are not practicing Jews, but by the law. Okay, they're kind of like CEOs, you know, Christian, Christians, you know, Christmas, Easter only, you know. That's kind of how they go to church, you know, back in those days. And, and so, you know, and all of a sudden this guy starts, says, and they see these, and they, they are, they're clueless. These aren't spiritual giants. The, the, the disciples were spiritually ignorant. Okay, they, they, they had no knowledge of all of this. I mean, you know, Matthew was a, a crook, you know. Peter liked to beat people up, you know. You know, you had some other guys that Luke was a doctor, but you had all these other guys. Judas was basically, well, we know his story. And, and so when, when Jesus shows up and they see him doing all this, in their mind, this is going to be huge. This is the guy. And I can go from being just a lowly tax collector, or I can be going from just a fisherman, and I can move up in the organization, and I can become somebody. They, they didn't follow Jesus because of the spiritual nature. They followed Jesus because they were selfish and they were looking out for themselves and they were thinking, hey, I can get caught up in this organization. That's who Jesus started out with, folks, over 2,000 years ago to change the world. It, it would be like going and, and, and asking, you know, somebody who had no mechanical skills, hey, come with me and let's, let's build it, rebuild this Peterbilt. That, that's pretty much what it was like. They, they, these guys didn't have any knowledge. They, they, they weren't necessarily big students of the law. They were just guys trying to grind out a living. And that's who Jesus started this with. And so when he gets into, when he starts in Matthew 6, there's some great chapters in here. In Matthew 6, Matthew, Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7, 11, 13, and 15 are some of the most recognized teachings of Jesus. These guys had never heard this stuff before. The Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the meek. That, that, that had never been taught in the Old Testament. Now, some prophets got up and spoke to it, but it wasn't the norm of the religious leaders. They weren't meek. They were just arrogant jerks. The Sadducees and Pharisees were jerks. They are the picture of hypocrisy. You want to see a picture of hypocrisy? Go just read some of the stories on them. It was all about the position in the organization covered up under the name of, of God. And so when you look at some of these chapters that Jesus starts talking about, it totally freaks people out. And one of the reasons that Jesus had such a following is because for the first time, people are hearing things they've never heard before. 
They, 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 they hear a story that gives some kind of truth. They're, giving, they're hearing stuff that talks about daily life and, and how to live. Just here are some of the things that it talks about. Well, the Beatitudes, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the meek, uh, you know, blessed are, you know, you know, he talks about anger, he talks about lust, he talks about divorce, he talks about loving our enemies, he talks about prayer, you know, how to pray. You know, and when he talks about how to pray, it's totally different than everything they've ever heard about praying. Do you know that now you can go at the Wailing Wall? You go at the Wailing Wall over there in, in Israel. And the way that Jerusalem is built is that if you ever see pictures of Jerusalem, the Wailing Wall, you'll notice that the different stones are called different sizes. And, and, and so they're, they're now, you know, as they go up, they get smaller and smaller. That's not the Jerusalem Wall. The Jerusalem wall is below us. It's below. And the, and, and, and the Jerusalem wall, the stones were probably four feet by three feet by four feet. It's incredible. They have this thing called the Wilson Arch and you stand underneath it and, and the stones are massive. I mean, they're six feet by four feet by five feet and, and it's an arch and there's no nails. There's no conduit, condu, there's no steel, there's nothing holding it up there. But they knew how to build and it's all helped by pressure. You know, you, you talk about an, an architectural, you know, it, it's incredible. And you stand there and it's been there for several thousand years. You see, what happened is, is that every time Jerusalem, the walls got tore down, they rebuilt them. They rebuilt them with smaller stones. So when you're standing at the, at the ground level of, of the Wailing Wall, 60 feet below you, you can go down on archaeological digs and see the actual real wall. You know? And, and this wall goes up another 70 feet. And, and so at the Wailing Wall, what they do is the Jewish people, they go there and the guys will write prayers. It's only the men. And they'll write prayers. And you'll see them stand there doing this. And, and they stick these prayers in these little cracks. As if God's going to pull them out at night and read each one of them. <laughs> and they've been doing that for, for thousands of years. And I mean, it's, it's just stuff. I'm thinking, no wonder the wall stays up now. It's got all that paper stuck in it. You know, it gets wet, turns into paste. You know, I, but, but that's their mind. And so Jesus talks about praying and, he, and he, he talks about it in a whole new way. And they're like, who is this guy? You know, and he begins to relate to their pain and their, their hurt. And, and the first time he's going around and he's healing people. You know, and, and, and he's going around and, he, and he's, he's giving people hope. And, they, they, and, and these disciples are sitting back here and they have no clue what's going on, folks. When we read about them in the Bible, this is after three years with Jesus. You know, and, and you know, so, you know, we look at Jesus around 30, 33 A.D. Most of the Gospels were written anywhere from 50 to 80. AD. And so, and so when, when, when you look at them, they had lots of years to learn how to grow. They, they were just plain rookies when Jesus started pulling them out of where he pulled them out of. And so he knew that he had to teach these guys. And so he deals with prayer. He deals with money. He, you know, why money? Why was money so big? Because money is what drove the economy. Money is where you got your self-worth. There were two classes, rich and poor. You know, and, and, and so everybody was trying to have a scheme. You talk about multi-level marketing. They had all kind of it back then. That's where it came from. It's biblical. All right. Amway came from the Bible. Uh, they, he talked about giving to the poor. He talked about not judging people. And see, that was huge for these people because who had, who had been judged all these years? The Jews. Because their enemy had judged them and, and basically told them that they were worthless and they were no good. And here this guy that professes to be the son of God doing miracles is saying to them, you are of value. And people began to go, wow. It's a whole different message than what was going on in the Old Testament. And, and he, he talked about building life on a solid foundation. He talks about the kingdom of God. And then he talks about building faith. But, but when it comes to chapter 18, it, it seems like what the church has done is said, yeah, let's just kind of bypass this. And the reason 
is because chapter 18 is a chapter of about accountability. It's a chapter to the believers. You, you, you see, what, what Jesus knew that he had to do, Jesus knew that, that he had to begin to prepare the people for what was going to come. See, because the church didn't exist till when? Acts 2. Church didn't exist until Jesus died, crucified, and rose again. And in Acts 2, Peter gets up, preaches to the thousands, and the church really begins. So Jesus is preparing. Why is he preparing them? Well, in the New Testament, the word church is used 114 times in 111 different verses. And the majority of it is in the Gospels by Jesus. Why? Because he knew that when he was gone, that the church would carry his message. All these chapters where Jesus teaches that I just called off, five, six, you know, all those, Jesus is talking to the believers. And he's saying this. The end of the story is in Matthew. When it's all said and done, the purpose of Jesus is Matthew 28, 18 and 19. Those are some of the last words Jesus spoke. And it summarized his very purpose. And it defines the very role and the purpose of the church. If that were not the purpose of the church, none of us would be here and have a personal relationship with Christ. And here's what he says. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Not some, not those that are easy, not those that are convenient, not those that you have to pay a price for. Go to all nations. All nations. I mean, it, it, that means go to Iraq. That means go to Iran. That means go to Afghanistan. That means go to Africa. That, that means go to the innermost parts of South America. That means go to Detroit. That means that it goes to all those places. All right? That's just for you, sir. All right? And he says, go to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here's what it says. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now here's the deal, folks. That's why we're here. That's Jesus' purpose. We're his disciples. And that's why we're here. So what Jesus did, knowing that that was going to be some of the last words he spoke, he started in Matthew 5 and moved through most of those chapters. And he was teaching the believer, the church, how then shall we live? Because if we didn't, we don't live this way, how then do we have credibility with those out there that it's okay to come here? If we don't flesh out our life as a Christian, if we don't live it out in our daily lives, and we're seeing the same as the world, then how do we do what Jesus said we're supposed to do? You see, what happens is we get so self-centered and think that the whole thing about Jesus was just about my salvation and me going to heaven and him taking care of me now. And when we get that narrow focused, we've missed the point of the gospel. And so when it comes to Matthew 18, what Jesus begins to do is he begins to address some of the human mindsets and some of the issues that they deal with. So let's go to Matthew 18 and we're going to read verses 1 through 6. About at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to him and put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth. Now this is God. So when Jesus says, I tell you the truth, he's talking, this is truth. <laughs> it's true truth. It's the real deal. It's, 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 not, an, it's, it's not an alternative. It's not, a, it's not a, a, a mixed version. 
This is the truth. Okay? Unless, okay, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of God. So anyone who becomes as humble child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. Now, this is just kind of an off thing. Do, do, do you understand why children's ministry is important? <laughs> do, do, we, we don't have children's ministry just to make it convenient for mom and dad to drop off their kids. <laughs> All right? What, what we know is the older we get, and the more we have experience in life and get burned and get hurt in life, the more skeptical we become and the less trusting we become and, and the more negative we become. And when people talk to adults about knowing Jesus, most adults will turn their back and walk away and go, yeah, right. But the heart of a child is so innocent that they'll listen. And so children's ministry and youth ministry isn't a byproduct just so we can keep them out of our hair and adults of us can do real church. All right? Jesus says it right here. And then listen to what he says. But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin at any time, not just as a child, but as they grow through life, this is applied to anybody. It would Better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of sea. So Jesus says, don't mess with my kids. Amen. <laughs> don't lead my kids astray. Now, a kid can be, God's kid can be four years old and God's kid can be 90 years old. Okay, God's kid is God's kid. Don't lead them astray because of your messed up junk. Don't lead them astray because you got stuff you haven't dealt with. Don't lead them astray and be negative because you got hurt and got your feelings hurt and didn't check your ego at the church door and you're mad and so don't do that. See what Jesus is doing is that he's preparing people to understand how the church should operate. That this is about how the church should function. This is about how we come together as, as a body and, and what we're supposed to do. You know, Paul talks about it when he says that, that the stronger Christian is supposed to lift up the weaker Christian. Right? That, that's what the body does. We don't hear the weaker Christian complaining and griping and go, yeah, I know how you feel. That, 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 that right there is not the role of the body. The, the body is that we are supposed to lift up. It's, it's like marriage. You know, marriage is not 50-50. Huh? It's not 50-50. That's what they say. Kids say, it's not 50-50. All right? Yeah? Marriage is 90-10. Marriage is 20-80. It's 65-45. It, it, what it depends on is that when the other is weak, the other one is strong. That, that, that's how marriage works. And when it becomes 50-50, then what happens is we keep a scorecard. And, 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 we, and we get angry and we get bitter and we get resentful because we felt like we did our part and the other person didn't their part. Well, maybe the other person didn't do their part because they're in pain, they're in hurting. And so what do you have to do? You, you got to go 90-10. You got to go 70-30. It's the same way in the church. Why is that? Because what did Jesus relate the church to? His bride. And what does he do for us? When we are weak, he is strong. He says, come unto me that you, and, and you're the heavy laden or heavy burden. You know, that's his role as the groom. And so there is a picture of what the marriage is and what the church is. So we're supposed to be that to one another. And so here's the scenario. In Mark 9, if you go to Mark 9, what happens is Jesus is walking down the road. Same scenario as this, but Matthew left off a part of it. And in Mark 9, when you look at it, they're walking down the road. They're traveling. And when they get to Capernaum where they're going... And they get ready to bed now. Jesus goes up to two of these disciples and he says, Hey guys, what were you talking about on our journey? Now here's the deal. You, you just got to understand. They weren't talking. They were fighting. 
two of Jesus' twelve were fighting. And the reason they were fighting is because when you go back to Matthew 5 and you get into Matthew 6 when Jesus is talking, he, he, he addresses the issue about who will be greatest in the kingdom. Now remember what I told you? They were, or, they were focused on what? The organization. And the kingdom was the organization. They're rookies. They, they don't get this whole kingdom of God thing yet. They haven't been in the game long enough to understand the dialogue. You, you ever been around people and they, they, they use a different dialogue and you're like, what are you talking about? I used to do some consulting work for a, a telephone company, a big telephone company years ago, and it was in Tampa. And you'd get around them and they had all these acronyms. Well, the TMC and the LVD, we got to heck it up the XYZ. And I'm sitting here going, you know what? I'll stick my finger up my nose and just do that. I had no clue what they were talking about. And then they gave me this little manual and it's about that thick and you go in and it's just page after page after page of acronyms that mean something. Like I'm supposed to memorize that, you know. Well, that's kind of how it was with these guys. Jesus is using these lines and, and they don't understand. And some of you may have that experience when you came into this whole new Jesus thing in your life. You'd go to church, you know, and it's like some people, you know, and, and, and here's the thing. And I love this song, but it's a song that causes problems. There's power in the blood. Power. And people, you know, that are seekers or unchurched, they walk in, they go, what does that mean? There's power. What? They, they don't understand the history behind that song. And that, that's the problem with a lot of songs. They, they were written a long time ago by, by great fathers of the faith, but they were written using words and vernacular and theology that non-church people sit there and go, well, that doesn't make sense to me. They, they don't get it. And so I told, I told our music guy one time, I said, if you're going to do power in the blood, stop and explain it. Help people understand it because it is a confusing point and everything from that point on if they don't understand what the message is that's their perception that's the filter everything for the whole service goes through. That's just the filter they don't get it. So you, you got to explain this and so that's where these guys were. And so they were arguing who is going to be on Jesus' right hand and who's going to be on his left hand. Who is going to be his number one guy and number two guy? They were arguing. And so Jesus asked them, what were you guys arguing about? And they said, well, we're talking about who's going to be the first in the kingdom. And he said, well, let me tell you. And this is where it comes into Matthew 18, 1 and says, if you're going to be great in my kingdom, you've got to be like a child. Now, the faith of a child is pretty innocent, isn't it? You tell a child a Bible story and they're just like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. You know? Children just, they're innocent. My, my youngest daughter was three years old and we lived in Florida and, and you know, everybody has a pool in Florida. And, and uh, you know, we, we didn't have a pool in Texas when we lived in Texas and moved to Florida. And so she's standing on the edge. Th she's three. And, and she, you know, she's a daredevil. You know, I spanked her for the first time. You know, when she's about three, I lit her up about twice, you know. And, uh, I mean, I lit her up because she's a little snot. And uh, I, I lit her up with my hand and she turned and looked at me and goes, that all you got? <laughs> and I knew my life was ruined. <laughs> I walked out of her bedroom, walked out in the hall, and just busted up laughing. Then I got, I went in mad, you know. And she's like, it she didn't phase her. I mean, you, just, you, you ain't got nothing. You know, she and I wrestled and we did all kind of stuff and she was a kid, teenager, and, and you know, and then in her tent. And one day we were wrestling, running through the house and, and I'm jumping over stuff and I'm body slamming her on the couch and, you know, and, you know, and she'd come back and we stopped to take a breath and I said, uh, uh, I said, you had enough? And uh, she said, I'm going to knock you out, Dad. <laughs> And I said, oh, she's like nine. I said, oh, yeah, right, bring it. That little snot hauled off, and, and she was a little tank. She hit me right here, knocked the wind out of me, dropped me to my knees, and walked off and said, don't mess with me. <laughs> That's my kid, all right? And so she's standing at this pool, and I said, jump. And I'm right at the end of the pool, about a foot away. She goes, get back. She'd never been in a pool. So I stepped back. No, get back. I did. Step back. Get back. I was halfway across the pool. 
Now she took off running and jumped. You know why? Because she knew dad was there. And she knew that if she missed dad and went under, dad was going to get her out of trouble. You see, that's, that's the pictures that we should have that kind of faith in our Heavenly Father that we know he's going to get us out of trouble. And that's what Jesus is saying here. And, and so he says, first of all, you, you, you have got to have. Now, when, when you take and you look at this right here, what are some of the characteristics of a child? First of all, they're humble. It, it, isn't it true kids are humble even when they're smart Alex? And you know why they're humble? Because they don't have life experience to jack them up. They don't have pain. They don't have hurt. They don't have failure. They, they don't have betrayal. They don't have that stuff yet. Because what we do is we're trying to protect them. But what happens is the older we become, we begin to replace what Jesus talks about is about humility and, and, and having a soft heart and sincere heart. We begin to let experiences define us. And so these disciples, because they were poor and because they wanted their shot and they knew that they were never going to get their shot because they weren't out of the Roman, you know, birthright and they didn't come out of the birthright of the priesthood and all that, that they were always going to be kind of the lower life. This was their shot to be something. And so here they'd spent time with Jesus. They'd seen the miracles. God had, you know, they'd seen God do stuff. They'd never seen it before. Instead of focusing on the spiritual, they focused on their position in the organization for personal gain. And you know that's one of the biggest dangers in churches. Is people come in and they're not focused on the mission of the church in Matthew 28 that we go into all nations beginning with our local community. They're just worried about what board do I get to sit on or what committee do I get to lead because I've got all this experience. And I'm going to tell you this, in the name of Jesus and in love, God doesn't care what experience we have. He doesn't care where we've come from. He doesn't. What God cares about is our heart. And are we willing to serve at any level? He said, the least shall be first. The least shall be first. And many times what causes churches to go south is because people come in and they stand around, they look around and go, well, I've got more experience than that. I've got more experience than that. And they focus on the organization and how they think it should be run rather than focus on the vision and the mission of what the church is all about. And Jesus knew that. And so he's trying to prepare the people. And he says, you've got to have a heart like a child. And so then he says, turn from your sin. Well, what, 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 what's some of the sin that Jesus is talking about here? Well, some of the sin that's just human in human nature. How about let's start with pride. Well, I, I, I served as chairman of the building committee. We don't have committees here. Don't use that word around here. That's a satanic word. <laughs> we don't do committees. We don't do boards. We do teams. Okay? We do teams. See, every one of you in this room, we're, we're all created equal, but we're different in purpose. Everybody has a giftedness that God has given you different He's given you talents. He's given you experiences. And those are just not by happenstance. Those were given to you as a, a reason to further and build his community. Every one of us. Which means every one of us should be serving in some way. Now, some serving based on giftedness is out front. Some is behind. Some is sweeping the floor. Some's cleaning the kitchen. Some is, is, is picking up manure at our events. And we've got a couple that they swear they're gifted in that, okay? I didn't know it was a gift. Where'd they go? Where's Kathy and Steve? Where's Kathy and Steve? There they are right there, you know? And, 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 and so they were out there and, and they're out there at this thing and they're scooping it all up. And I mean, they're, they're Johnny on the spot. I mean, they got passion about manure, okay? They got passion about manure. And I said to Steve, Steve, you're a little passionate about that. He said, because I'm a turdologist, okay? And so that's where the phrase came from. And I mean, I mean, they're standing there like, you know, as soon as the horse comes back through the gate, if that horse messed up, I mean, they're, uh, <laughs> and they're back. And I mean, they were passionate about manure, okay? They weren't passionate about manure. You know what they were passionate about? 
They're passionate about representing us as a church to maintain integrity to that nation, to the owners of that arena, to the people out there to set an example with manure. That's what they were passionate about. You know, the phrase that will never be allowed in this church, and if you use it, I will knock you out. We will never say, we ain't never done it that way before. Those are the seven most deadliest words the church says. Because when we say that, we quench the move of the Holy Spirit in our lives. If we'd have said that when it came to this land, well, we ain't never, I've never seen a church do a lease purchase and a land contract. We wouldn't have that land. We sit down with the owners of it. We didn't go through realtors, you know, and it was amazing. I mean, it was like, can you do this? Yeah, we can do that. This is the owners. Can you do that? Yeah, we can do this. You can do that. They looked at you. Yeah, we can do that. Okay, where's the papers? I mean, that was how fast this conversation went, literally. Am I, am I, am I lying over there? No, it was crazy. It was crazy, was it not? I mean, it was like bam, bam, bam. And then we spent the next hour talking about where they're from and what they do and on and on and sharing the vision of the church. But, but I've never dealt with a deal that way. You go through realtors and you get an engineer and you get an architect and you go through all this process. And we did it completely backwards. <laughs> Everything about what we did to get that land was backwards. But it was God's deal because we were open to it. And we didn't rely on the fact of our past experiences. You see, when we rely on the fact of our past experiences, no matter if we've come from another church, whether it was good or bad, especially if it's a bad experience, if we rely on what we experienced in the past, we miss out on what God has for the future. We miss out on the new thing He wants to do in our lives. And believe me, God wants to do a new thing in every one of your lives, no matter what your age is. So whatever your past is, let it go and let God begin a new thing. Don't hang on to the hurt. Don't hang on to the betrayal. Don't hang on to the lies. And folks, believe me, if anybody has a right to sit up here and say this, it's me. Okay? You got to let it go because if you don't let that stuff go, then what happens is you infect the church here. You know, well, the last church I came from, they did this, and I just don't trust. Shut up. <laughs> Go back to that church then. But come here with an open heart and an open mind and say, God, do a new thing in my life, and don't worry about the organization and how it's run. All right? Worry about what God's called you to do. And so we have arrogance. We had, we had the disciples became self-centered. They, it was all about them. They lost focus of the purpose. They, 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 forgiveness. Do you know that if, if you and I don't forgive somebody, okay? So, so let me say, say this. I'll use Judy. Say Judy does something and ticks me off and hurts my feelings, okay? Well, she has, but that's okay. Uh, okay? And, 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 and let's say that I don't forgive her. And I go around just griping and complaining. Do you know that at the moment I don't forgive her, that my relationship with God goes on pause? Because Jesus said it. If you don't forgive those who've sinned against you, how can I forgive you? That's what Jesus said. So at the minute I say, I'm not going to forgive you, 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 I will never forgive you, Judy. At that moment, my relation, God does not bless me. My prayer time is not heard. God does not, I don't have the power. I don't have the Holy Spirit in my life. What I have as a Christian is my past. From that moment, back. But until I say, I forgive Judy, God has got me on hold. Because how can he bless me and work in my life when I won't forgive him, but the very thing he did for me was forgiveness, which gave me eternal life and salvation and power and abundance and live through the day. It's hypocrisy. So I'm on hold. The problem with that is that when that carries over into church, it becomes toxic. 
And so what Jesus is saying to these guys, forget what your past teaching is. You, you, you got to let it go. Jealousy. You know, and, and the other thing is, is that when we don't have forgiveness, we, we fail to serve in our positions because we're mad. You know, I've had the opportunity to serve on some big church staff and in the music program, no offense to musicians, but music programs and big churches, I think they just ought to disband them. Because it doesn't come about the worship, it became about performance. And, and, and I have seen friends, people that I knew that were in ministry that would get mad because they didn't get picked to sing a solo. And then they'd have this little group, well, I can sing better than them, I can sing better than them. Well, I can play the piano better than them. Well, I, I can do this better than them, you know. And they would get in, and so you have these choirs with two, three hundred people, and there'd be about 25 clicks. And so when somebody would get up there and, and, and they're singing, and you know, you look at the choir and they're all, they're doing this. Because it's not their friends singing. And, and, and then choirs, and, and here's the deal. And, and then when those people that were mad that they didn't get to sing, they got to sing, they'd get up. And you know what it was? It was performance. It was mechanical. There was no God in it. There was no worship in it. And you just felt embarrassed for them. And, and, and that happens in so many different areas of the church. People get their shorts in a wad. Excuse me, it's cowboy church, I can say that. They, they, get the, they get their shorts in a wad because they didn't get picked. Here's the deal. Much is given, much is required. Maybe what we need to do is start loving manure. And start there and be faithful with the little things. And then God blesses us when he sees that our heart's in the right place. And so why Jesus was teaching this to the disciples is because who was going to be the leaders of the church when the church got going later on in Acts 2? They would be. Peter started the first church. He preached the first revival. As a result of it, the church, the church began and he needed to understand what the message was if he was going to fulfill what God had called for them to do. See, there's a difference in servant leadership and leadership. Servant leadership is I identify a need and I fix it based on my skills and giftedness. Servant leadership says, what can I serve that gives me recognition? That's the difference. See, there's a difference in success and significance. Success is about me. Significance is about others. And the church should be servant leader driven. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. Because that's how we reach an unchurched world. Is because we serve people. We accept people for who they are. Warts and all, no judgment. We love them for who they are. So let me give you a couple things real quick and we'll wrap up. What's the signs of a healthy church? You know what the number one sign of a healthy church is? You ready for this? Ready, ready, ready? When every one of us walk through those doors right there, we leave our egos there. We check our egos at the door. None of us is any better than anybody else. Just because I serve as a pastor doesn't mean I'm better. Don't put me on a pedestal. Don't do it. You know, I'm no different. Probably I, I struggle just like you all struggle. I have my issues just like you all struggle. We check our egos at the door. We come in. We're equal. We're, we're, we're at the same place in life. We're at the same level in life. And, and whatever I live in, whatever I drive, or how many zeros are on the back of my salary, your salary means jack squat. We're equal. We check our egos at the door. Because when we do that, then we can be honest and loving and accepting of everybody. Number next, we seek to serve. We don't sit around and just say, well, they'll do it. They'll do it. Yesterday we sent out a, a quick text and to say, hey, you know, we're going to be short this morning and um, set up. And man, thank you for all that showed up. And I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty because we know some of you couldn't get out, some of distance, health, all that. But thank you because usually it takes us about 45 minutes to set up. And, and I got here late and we were set up by nine o'clock. It's crazy. We had so many people seek to serve in any little way. Use your giftedness. Use short 
sell yourself, ladies and gentlemen, when you don't use your giftedness that God has given you, your gifts, you don't use your gifts that God has given you, you miss out on the blessing. You miss out on impacting people's lives. Every one of you is gifted in some way. And that giftedness is what makes it unique. And churches just operate on giftedness deficits. Because people think, well, they'll get it done. Well, they'll get it done. You know, it, 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 that's not the assumption. Any little thing helps. Find your giftedness. Find your purpose. Your purpose in life is the giftedness that God gave you, not what your career is. Your purposeness is the gift that God gave you. Now, if your career fits into it like mine, great. But if it doesn't, doesn't. But every one of your careers is a ministry. You know why? Because you're around people. It's a ministry. Doesn't matter where you work. It's an opportunity. And you have a giftedness to use that to touch people's lives. The next thing is protect the biblical behavior of the church. Do you hear me? You protect the biblical behavior that Jesus teaches, and we're going to get into that later, and you do it out of love, which is called accountability. And none of us like accountability. All right? You ever like anybody walk up to you and go, hey, you know, yeah, it's a little rough around the edges. You might want to tone that back. Shut up. You don't know me. All right? Yeah. Who are you? Well, I may not know you, but you're a Christian. I'm a Christian. And I may see how that helps. And, you know, we're just trying to help each other do this thing. All right. Number next is, I mentioned it earlier, don't let past experience, church experiences, define your spiritual growth. And some of you may have. You're hanging on to the past. Let it go. You know, let it go. That's what Paul said. Paul said, don't look at the past. All the past does is keep you, on, keep you focused out there. Eventually, you're going to crash into something there. You're going to miss out what God has for the future. The past helps grow you and prepare you for the future. Do you realize that? Your past is what prepares you to accept what God has for you in the future. We all go through seasons. Every season is a growth season. And I've said it before. You're either coming out of a season or you're going into a season. <laughs> Just life. All right? And then the last one will say, uh, unload our judgment and our perceptions. Unload our judgments and perceptions. Somebody walks in and they're dressed different. You know how long it takes for us to look at somebody and come up with our judgment call of what we think they are? They used to have a thing back in the 60s called the four-minute rule. It took four minutes for us to see somebody, look them up and down, talk to them, have a conversation, and then we'd come up with our conclusion. You ready? You ready? You ready? You ready? You ready? Six seconds. That's today. Walk in and go, hmm, hmm, okay. Because we have a perception. We have a perception about how they're dressed, you know, how the, what they say, what they don't say, and we automatically make a judge. Where's our perception from our past experience? That's judging that person based on the past. God's not into that. Drop your judgment. Drop your perception of people. You know, people see somebody come in and, you know, they may be dressed different and, and they pull up in a nice car and all of a sudden their perception is, oh, they're just a little rich snot. Never said a word to them. They never said a word to them. But all of a sudden, that's our perception, so we just kind of stay away from them. Now, God's not into that. See, what God's saying to us in this is that we got to be like kids. we got to be humble, you know, and, and we got to keep focused on the focus on the purpose and not the organization. And we got to serve humbly. Yeah? And in humility, men, listen to me, men, listen to me, men, humility doesn't necessarily go along with manhood. Especially in the cowboy world. Or especially in the western lifestyle world. You know, especially. It really doesn't. Why? Because we think humility is a sign of weakness. You know, we're afraid we're going to be called a Twinkie. You know, we're going to be called a sissy. In the Beatitudes, Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they're what? Blessed are the meek. You know what the word meek means? It's a Greek word. It means strength. And the picture was, in the Greek, they had these beautiful white stallions. They were war horses. They were powerful. They were thick. They bred them to be, to be almost like attack animals. And the picture of meekness was, an, was a rider 
on the back of that horse bareback with just a leather strap in its mouth and control that stallion. That stallion had the strength to dump that rider and to hurt that rider. But meekness is strength under control. And the picture is this rider bareback with just a leather strap and this powerful horse. And these horses, 12, 1300 pounds thick. And just holding that horse and that horse is under control. That's meekness. That's humility. That's what we need to be as a church. To be able to be used by God to make a difference. And that's our ultimate purpose. We're here to make a difference. And I have people come up to me all the time saying, man, this church, this church man has made a difference in my life. Well, good. You know what, what causes churches not to make a difference anymore? All of us. You know what causes churches not to be friendly anymore? All of us. Because we stop being it. No matter how big we become, it's all of us that keep it friendly. It's all of us that work together as a community and a family. And that's what Jesus was trying to get into these disciples so that when they understood their role, they could begin to help start other churches and teach them to do that thing. And that's what he's saying to us in these first six verses of Matthew. Let's pray. God, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for loving us. <laughs> thank you, God, that you want us to know you in a full, rich way. Be the people you want us to be. So God, I pray for all of us that we would just take a little inventory of ourselves and say, God, where am I? Am I serving? Am I checking the ego at the door? Am, 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 am I skeptical because of my past? God, what is it that I need to do to serve and to be blessed in serving? And Father, that, that, may, you know, Father, that may mean just it's picking up the manure, whatever that is. It's the jobs that are unnoticed. It's the jobs that are, you know, not the fun jobs. But it's just the jobs. And if it's the job that's up front, God, keep us humble. Keep us humble in all of it. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, we'd fail you. It'd be the biggest mistake of our lives, my life, is to not give you the opportunity to come to know Christ. He says that... He wants us to have an abundant life. He wants to bless us. He wants to forgive us. He wants to give us peace. And he does that through the forgiveness of our sins. Our sins are just, we miss God's mark. And if we just admit that we've missed a mark and there's sin in our life, that the Bible says that he comes into our life and becomes our Lord and Savior and gives us the power to deal with this life while we're here in the promise of eternity. And if that's something you'd like to do, you can have that conversation with God in the parking lot of Walmart on the side of the road. You can have it here. And we'd love to be able to help you understand that. And if that's a decision you'd like to make, please see us, see me, and be more than glad to share that with you. Father, thank you for your blessings on us. Be with those that are traveling. Keep them safe. Father, help us to be the church that stands in the gap. Father, help us to be wise stewards of the resource that you've given us, the land that you've given us. And Father, it's not about the land, it's about the purpose of the church. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.